Well, good morning. Whoa, that's loud. Good morning to you all. I know we can't sing in here, but you can say good morning. It is uh, a joy, and really I find it a privilege to be uh, here among you, uh, back here on this campus, uh, speaking from this lectern, this time with no uh, tuition to pay for my child. So there's a particular joy here in this. And I do, as um, Dr. Capic said, I just published this book, The Beautiful Community, and that's going to be the title, uh, or, the, or the theme, rather, of my talks to you uh, today and tomorrow morning. There's a subtitle for each, each of these talks this morning. It's on the beautiful community, subtitled, The Life of Royalty. The Life of Royalty. Let me pray and then open with God's Word. Father, thank you for this time, for this day, for this word of yours that's alive and active and sharp. I pray that you would speak to your people, your truth, grow us up in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, to whom belongs all glory and praise. Amen, amen, and amen. Two passages of Scripture that are likely familiar to uh, most, if not all of us, in here, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, and Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 uh, to 48. Genesis chapter 1, the Word of God tells us there that God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over the livestock Oh, and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth, words of our Savior Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For me, he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. In his recent book, Love Your Enemies, how Decent People Can Save America from the Culture of Contempt, the author, Arthur Brooks, writes about an encounter from September 26, 2017, between a man named Hawk Newsom, who is, the, at the time at least, was the president of the Black Lives Matter chapter in New York, and a white man named Tommy Hodges. The encounter took place at the National Mall in Washington, D.C., just a few weeks after the tragic events in Charlottesville, Virginia. In fact, Hawk Newsom had actually been wounded in Charlottesville and was still nursing his wound after being hit in the face with a rock. And for his part, Tommy Hodges was in D.C. as an organizer of a pro-Trump rally. Hawk Newsom and the team of people with him were bracing for another confrontation. The pro-Trump folks and the Black Lives Matter folks were hurling insults at each other, and then something unexpected happened. Tommy Hodges invited Hawk Newsom on the stage to address the pro-Trump rally. Hodges said, we're going to give you two minutes of, your, of our platform to put your message out. Whether they disagree or agree with your message is irrelevant. It's the fact that you have the right to have the message. Hawk Newsom, who is a Christian, said a prayer and then 
he addressed the crowd. I'm not going to run through the whole account. You can uh, search for it online and, and find and watch it for yourself. I'm just going to tell you uh, about an encounter after Hawk spoke. A man named Kenny Johnson, who's a leader in a group called Bikers for Trump, approached him. And Johnson said about Hawk, I feel what he, came, what he said came from his heart when he got on the stage. I probably agree with 90% of what he said. I listened to him with much love, respect, and honor, and I got that back. My point is not to say that this is an example of how to eradicate deep disagreements. Here is my point. If I asked you to tell me this morning who you are, what would you say to me to that question? I'm sure I'd get a number of different responses. I'd hear things like, I'm a Christian. I'm an African American. I'm Korean. I'm Latino. I'm a man. I'm a, I'm a woman. I'm a father. I'm a mother. I'm a sister. I'm a brother. I'm an aunt. I'm a cousin. I'm an uncle. On and on it might go. Would it come to your mind to answer that question by saying, I'm a king, I'm a queen. Would that be something that comes to your mind? You might consider that to be a bit arrogant sounding, but it's not. It's actually the truth. What is the first thing that the Bible says about humanity? We heard it in that passage. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and over everything that moves over the earth. In her book, God's Many Splendored Image, author Nona Verna Harrison, she rightly says the word dominion there in Genesis 1 speaks of a royalty, which is a facet of the divine image in every human person. Royalty involves dignity and splendor and a legitimate sovereignty rooted in one's very being. I want you to do me a favor this morning. It's participation time. I know that we are socially distanced, but you've got people to the side of you. I, I want to ask you to do me a favor. Turn to the person next to you in either direction. Just, just turn. Find somebody. Meet them, all right? You got it? Okay? On the count of three, I want you to say these words after me, okay? On the count of three, we're all going to say these words. We're going to say, hello, your majesty, but we're not going to say it softly. On the count of three, ready? One, two, three. Hello, your majesty. All right, it's, I saw some of you even genuflect, right? That's a, right? Felt a little weird. I don't know that you've ever walked up to anybody that you have met and said, greeted them with those words, hello, your majesty. It's not just that it feels strange for us to say it out loud. It's like, it's, it's the case that it's also strange for us to think it because that's not our internal default disposition when we are considering other human beings. Sin has got us all jacked up. <laughs> As a result of the pervasive nature of sin, what happens is the gruesome aspects of, human, of the human predicament are often more prominent in our hearts, eyes, and in our minds than the glorious aspects. But the Bible does not begin with the fall. The Bible does not begin describing humanity with death and depravity. It begins with a more true reality about human beings than our sinful condition. That truth is that we are made in the image and after the likeness of God, which means that every human being from the womb to the tomb is saturated through and through with royal dignity, regardless of age, ability, accomplishments, or anything else that differentiates us one from another. To quote Nona Verna Harrison again, she says, because everyone is made in the image of God 
And because this image defines what it means to be human, people are fundamentally equal regardless of the differences in wealth, education, and social status. And then she says the church proclaimed this countercultural message in the ancient world and still proclaims it now. The church's message in the ancient world was the fundamental equality and royal dignity of every human being. Well, who were the first recipients of, of those words we read in Genesis? The people of Israel were those first recipients, and they received it from the mouth of Moses. Well, when did they receive it? They received it after God had liberated them from slavery in Egypt. They had just experienced the pervasive reality of, in, of inequality and injustice and oppression among humanity. In the ancient Near Eastern world, oh, the only people who were understood to be the image of God or the gods was the king. And if you, if you uh, were associated or affiliated with the king by, uh, by citizenship in that nation, then you had dignity and rights. If not, you could be dehumanized. That's precisely why the Israelites were enslaved. They were an Egyptian. That's what Pharaoh says in Exodus 1. We got to deal shrewdly with the people of Israel. There are too many of them in our land. The Lord frees them from slavery, and the first thing he communicates them, uh, to them about humanity is that every person is image. July 4th, 1776, the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence begins with these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Can I tell you something this morning? The fundamental equality of human beings is not self-evident. Apart from a vision of humanity that is rooted in the biblical ethic, the opposite is self-evident. These words open the founding document of the United States of America, and at the same time, there is lived on the ground reality in the country that communicates the exact opposite of those very words. It's not self-evident on a collective level or on an individual level. Every single day, you and I have to fight against, have to push back against our tendencies and our temptations to deny the royal dignity of people. You don't believe me? Open your Twitter feed. Just scroll through. Even if most of the people you follow and most of the people who follow you are people who agree with your worldview, somebody is retweeting somebody who said something you don't agree with and you find intolerable. And when you see that come up on your Twitter feed, what is your first inclination? It's not royal dignity. <laughs> Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that human anger can be akin to murder, that human anger can be dangerous and destructive. James, in his letter, says, with our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be. Why does Jesus have to correct our understanding in the Sermon of the Mount when he says, you have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. He has to correct us because our default disposition when it comes to people with whom we have deep disagreements and animosity and even contempt is not to engage them from a disposition of love for royal image bearers. We want to engage them from a disposition of, 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 of disdain. We don't live like the royal dignity of every human being. We don't live like the fundamentally, fundamental equality of every person is self-evident. 
Jesus says, love your enemies. <laughs> and that's not a new concept in the New Testament. Let me give you just one example. Exodus chapter 23, verses 4 to 5. Uh, uh, the, the Lord has given his people the Ten Commandments in chapter 20, and now he's fleshing out for them what it looks like for them to follow these commandments he has just given them, particularly commandments 5 to 10, which have to do with our duty towards our neighbor. And the Lord says this to his people, if you see, if you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down, under his burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall surely rescue it with him. What's the point? In this section of Exodus, right, this is what it looks like to live out uh, the commandments that God gave over the duties to, to the neighbors. Did you notice the emphasis on loving enemies? If you meet your enemy's ox or donkey, <laughs> If you see the donkey of somebody who hates you, on the one hand, if the other person is somebody you can't stand, your enemy, on the other hand, if it's somebody who can't stand you, somebody who hates you, in either case, you help to meet their needs. That's what my people do, the Lord is saying. Think about somebody you can't stand right now. Like, I know it's hard. Or even think about somebody who can't stand you. Look, if they, if those people who come to mind encounter some hardship, you, all at le you will at least be tempted to think you're getting what you deserve. But God doesn't call his people to engage in karma. He calls us to engage in compassion, even towards those we are tempted to despise. You see, here's the deal. You or I do not own any do ox or donkeys, but there is a nowness to the opportunity to actively reject the disposition of contempt towards those we find utterly intolerable and to express the kind of love that demonstrates a commitment to promote the royal dignity of fellow image bearers. And here's why this is important. The theme of these messages I'm delivering, as I said, are the beautiful community. But what I, by that I mean unity and diversity, love across lines of difference in Jesus' name. And we were designed for this. We were designed by God as a royal humanity, not just as royal individuals. I, 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 gave, I had you look at one another to acknowledge the royalty of each other on purpose. It's not enough for me to think of just myself as royal, royalty or even to acknowledge that somebody else is. I have to begin imagining all of humanity together as the royal image. See, who is this God that we image? He himself is unity and diversity, diversity and unity as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The God that we image is beautiful community. Theologian Herman Bobbing put it well when he said, the Trinity reveals God to us as the fullness of being, the true life, eternal beauty. In God, too, there is unity and diversity diversity and unity. Indeed, this order and this harmony exists in him absolutely. He is the most perfect kind of community, a community of the same beings. He is the most perfect kind of diversity, a diversity of divine persons. Another theologian, John Frame, says there's no conflict in the Trinity. The three persons are perfectly agreed on what they should do and how their plan should be executed. They support one another, assist one another, promote one another's purposes. This intra-Trinitarian deference, this disposability of each to the others, he says, can be called mutual glorification. As his image, that's what we are made to reflect. And we never, look, we never get to the pursuit of beautiful community. We will never get to that kind of pursuit until we can envision our royal dignity and live it out in practice. 
me leave you this question as I close, because I am closing, not in a PCA, well, in a, yeah, in a PCA sort of way, which means I'm really closing. I mean, not in a Baptist sort of way, which means I got 10 more minutes. <laughs> who are the people, who are the people you're tempted to despise, dismiss, or dishonor internally or externally? Who are they? Those are the precise people the Lord wants you to think of as royal image bearers right now. Those are the precise people he wants you to begin thinking of in a different way. It doesn't mean that the deep disagreements will go away. It doesn't mean that you ought to excuse or ignore uh, injustice, unrighteousness, the things that are not in accord with God's word, his will, his way. It just means that you are striving to come to a place of willing and desiring their good to the glory of God. Amen, I'm done. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that we are your image, that we are royalty, that we have royal dignity. Father, forgive us for the ways in which we do not live into that truth as your people. And help us, Lord God, to grow up into a heart of love for neighbors that promotes their dignity, that honors them, and that glorifies you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Go in peace. <laughs>